We welcome you to Clearwater Community Church this morning. If you're visiting with us, we're especially glad that you're here. Uh, we would love to get to know you more. There's a welcome center in the back where you could stop by <clears throat> after services, and uh, people will have a little gift bag for you there. You can answer any questions that you have. Um, Josh and I would be glad to answer any questions that you have about the church, and don't be afraid to ask us. We're, we're more than willing to, to stop and talk. We, I know we stand up here, but we're really not that intimidating a group uh, if you get to know us, uh, but we'd love to spend some time talking with you, getting to know you more. Um, but uh, please, uh, don't hesitate if you have a question. We, we love to answer that, and we welcome you to Clearwater Community Church. If you have uh, your bulletins, you can look at them real quickly. I'm just going to highlight a couple of announcements on here. You'll see them come up on the screen. Next week, right after services for families, we are having a family picnic. This is something that's been going on the last Sundays of the month, <clears throat> and so especially for those that have elementary-aged uh, students, it's been a great time of fellowship to kind of bring a lunch and go out there and, and, and do some fun activities together. They've volunteered me up. They volunteered me. That's how I'm saying it. I did not really volunteer for this, but I'll be in a dunk tank next week to get dunked by students. So if you want to swing by to watch that, uh, maybe you can watch from the parking lot and laugh at me, but uh, that'll be going on after second hour after services next week. We do have a congregational meeting coming up on October 10th. That will again happen right after second hour, 12:15 on that day. Our annual meetings, we vote in our next group of elders that are coming on. We uh, approve of the budget, go over some of the finances, cast vision for the next year, all of those sorts of things. And we'll be doing that at this business meeting. But there are also some other details that will be taking place at this one. You'll be hearing about it over the next weeks, but we're updating and, and, and making a few edits within our, our bylaws and our constitution, that's an important thing, and, and we need our membership here to understand that and then to uh, approve of that. And so please mark on your calendars October 10th, right after second hour, we will be doing that. Uh, and then lastly, announcements that I have on the screen are, are concerning giving. Our offerings are being taken physically right now in the boxes in the back at the doors as you go out. Uh, if you brought a physical offering, you can drop it in there. You can give online. Upper right corner of our webpage is a tab for giving. You can give that way as well. But we thank the Lord for the way he's provided. It is the stewardship of Clearwater Community Church to uh, uh, worship our God well, even in our offerings and our tithes. And it's a, a stewarding of, of what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ that we do that. And so it's incumbent upon the members of the church to participate in that way. We don't want to neglect that, even though we're not physically passing an offering box, or an offer, offering box, right? We're not going to pull them off the wall. Uh, the plates and the bags that we have in the past. So please remember to do that. Other announcements, you can see them here or go online. Find them uh, online as well. Take your Bibles, turn to Acts chapter, Acts, Oof. Hebrews chapter 12, the end of chapter 12, and we'll be hitting on Hebrews chapter 13 this morning. We've preached Acts already. That's not our next sermon series. Hebrews chapter 12 and 13. We're coming into the close of this particular letter, and as we look at uh, chapter 13 especially, we're going to see a number of different commands that come up. I was talking to my wife last night. We were driving back from uh, Emily's started a job. She's working at Starbucks, so we decided to pop through the drive through and see how Emily was doing at her job. Um, and so we drove through, got some coffee, and then we were driving back. And I mentioned to my wife, I said, I'm preaching this text tomorrow that has all of these different commands in it, and they are seem all over the map. It's, we're going to be covering a wide range of topics in there. And she said, it sounds like you know, almost like these instructions you would give to a child as you're about to turn them loose into something for the first time. And I was like, that's exactly what this is like. You know, that, that first time you, probably the, the one I remember the most is last year when we dropped our daughter off for the first time at college. And you, you've come to this realization, have, have we done the job well enough to let her go on her own? And you're, you're sitting there with, as you're getting ready to say goodbye, you know, don't forget to do this and do this and remember this. And you know, all these last minute instructions that pour out and we get to the end of this letter, and it almost feels that way. Like, there's these things that the author wants to address and talk to, but they're not disconnected from what precedes it, and I, I want to emphasize that. This isn't just a, a haphazard list of instructions. It's, it's closely aligned with exactly what he's been saying, the author's been saying, through the rest of this particular letter. We saw over the past weeks, as we unpacked chapters 10, 11, 12 of Hebrews, that especially towards the end of 12, it culminates in this picture that the author holds out of 
you've come, you've approached to, because of the work of Jesus Christ and your trust in him, a mountain, but it's not Mount Sinai, this terrible picture of judgment, but it's Mount Zion. You have come to the very heavenly city of God, this joyous occasion where God is being worshipped. Therefore, because we've approached that as God's people, let us not refuse to heed the word that God has spoken to us. And that word culminates in his son, Jesus Christ, chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. God is going to shake the heavens and the earth again. And the only thing that will last at that great shaking of the earth, that is judgment when he shakes this universe, are those who have followed Jesus Christ. And we then, those that claim to be followers of Jesus Christ, are members now of that unshakable kingdom. And as he draws chapter 12 to a conclusion, then he says this, Therefore, since we are receiving that kingdom that cannot be shaken, and we are members of that kingdom, let us therefore, and here's these actions, let us be thankful and let us worship God acceptably with reverence and fear, for our God is a consuming fire. He gives us this exhortation that based on where we've come, who God is, what he's done for us, receiving Jesus Christ, we are to respond with gratitude seen in our service. And that was the end of our message last week. But it dovetails perfectly into this week's sermon. Chapter 13 isn't a disconnected series of commands. It actually is the outflow of chapter 12, verse 28 and 29 serve, worship God. How do we worship God? We worship Him like this, and His commands then show us and demonstrate to us, tell us how we serve gratefully our God. The way forward through service. And so that the idea that we're going to kind of unpack and speak about this theme is that how we as thankful servants of God, how the thankful servants of God act toward the various people that we encounter in our lives. And that's going to be the theme then of verses 1 to 6 that we're going to look at this week. Serve, service. The thing I want us to see and think about, even as we come into these commands, is that service is not optional. Many times I think we hear the word service and we think of it as an optional thing because of the way that it's presented, whether it's in the congregation or whatever. We'll, we'll ask for people to serve in a particular area of ministry. We need volunteers for children's ministry or youth or first impressions team. And people hear that and think, okay, somebody will step forward and volunteer to do that. It's an optional thing. And because I'm busy over here, I don't need to serve in that way. And so we, we view service as voluntary, as optional. But the author of Hebrews is challenging us to recognize that service is not optional for a believer. It's characteristic of a believer. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, this characterizes your life. This is what comes out of your life. We used to sing this song when I was in children's church, um, Sunday school as a little child or whatever, uh, The Lord's Army. Any of you remember that song from years ago? I may never march in the infantry, ride in the cavalry, shoot the artillery. I may never fly over the enemy, but I'm in the Lord's army. Probably completely politically incorrect in the world in which we live today, you know, shooting the enemy and stuff. Um, but the idea that we're a soldier of Jesus Christ, that, that picture of a soldier. The soldier doesn't go into military service and then decide, you know, I'm going to take or leave these duties. You know, like, I'll, it's optional. I can do what I want to do. I, that, that doesn't happen in military service. It can't. Military service is characterized by service. I used, I think I already said this a couple, or a week or two ago, but, you know, it was one of the more bizarre things of, of, of the COVID that has hit recently. We were, we were hit by COVID almost a month ago now, and it, we've come through it and everything else, but Tia kind of got that, that chest congestion a few, you know, like a week or two after the fact, and this is one of those things that characterizes this, and she had a, a visit with her doctor, a new doctor that she was seeking out to, to go in for a checkup, and she called the doctor and said, I really need to come in and get some advice about what's going on in my chest and my lungs, and, you know, is, can you prescribe something for me? And once, once the receptionist heard that, they said, oh, no, you can't come in and see the doctor. And she said, well, 
why can't I come in and see the doctor? I, have a, I actually have a visit scheduled, right, but that's a wellness visit. You cannot come and see the doctor right now because you're sick. And she's like, well, you're a doctor. That's what you do, right? Like, you, you see the sick. Nope. And, and, and it's, I'm, it's understandable. They're trying to triage the situation and put the sick over here and the well over here. But can you imagine at any other time in human history where a doctor would say, no, we don't see the sick? I mean, that's what you do. You're a doctor, right? But think about that in relationship to the Christian. This is what I'm getting at. It's not optional. You don't get to choose if you want to serve. You serve because you're a believer in Jesus Christ. And He served, and we model Christ. So how do we serve our God? And the author gives us in these five, I see five commands in verses 1 to 6. It really continues all the way through this chapter, but the theme switches a little bit after that. But how we as thankful servants of God act toward the people in our lives, serve the people in our lives. The first group that we come in contact with are our spiritual siblings here. Our spiritual siblings. He says in verse 1, keep on loving one another as brothers and sisters. Toward our spiritual brothers and sisters, we are to lovingly care for them. And over these next verses, we're going to see uh, a word. In, in the, it doesn't come out so well in English. It's actually much clearer in the Greek this, this word for love, and you know if you've been in church at any period of time that there's different ways that the New Testament speaks of, of love, different words that it uses, a number of synonyms that, uh, I'm glad I said synonym and not cinnamon because that could have easily come out wrong. That's what went in my mind right there. Uh, synonyms where you have these different ideas around this concept of love to describe the different relational components of it. This is the one, phileo, philos, love, and that root is in the three of these commands in verses 1, 2, and 5, and this is the first one that we see here. It says the command, the command states, let, and the word is Philadelphia, remain. That's what it says. And we are probably fine with that. Yes, let the Philadelphians remain in Philadelphia and not come down here, right? I'm from that region, and I understand the reputation that we have. But that word, actually, if you unpack it, means love. And Adelphos means brother and sister. It's brotherly love. Familial love is the concept here. Let that remain. Let that abide. It's the same verb that John uses over and over in his gospel to speak of remaining or abiding. Abiding in Jesus. There's a, connected, a connection to Jesus that connects us as that vine, and we are branches, that connects us to one another. There's His life flowing through us, and therefore we are brothers and sisters with one another in Jesus Christ. And the characteristic of a brother-sister relationship, of abiding and remaining, is one in which we demonstrate love to one another. And First John hits this all over the place, right? How can we say that we abide in Christ, or we are love Christ, or we are with Christ, if we don't love one another? Same theme that the author here hits on. Let that remain. Here's the point, that you are my brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ if you are in this church. Why? Because we are connected to one another. We are family. We're the family of God. And therefore, we are brothers and sisters with one another. We don't get to choose with whom we are going to be a brother and sister within this family like your siblings. You didn't get to choose your siblings. That doesn't happen. Mom and dad created them. Well, God created them through mom and dad, right? Same thing here. God birthed us into his family, and he has brought it about it to place us within this family so that we are brothers and sisters because of God's grace to us as we express our faith in Jesus Christ. We become a part of that family of God, and we have brothers and sisters then in Jesus Christ. As God's children belonging to this family, we are the Clearwater Community Church family. Last week, we brought in about 30-some new members through our member class into this family. That's awesome to see God grow it that way. But this isn't a country club, all right? You don't join and then you stay disconnected from everybody or know a few here and there. No, it's a family, so we need to get to know our brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ and connect with them. As a family, brothers and sisters, then, we serve God by caring for one another within this family. 
We are to lovingly care for our spiritual brothers and sisters. Sometimes that looks like physical care. We care for those who are sick. We come alongside and provide for them. And, and I mean, I, we, I received some of this when we were sick. And I know I was talking to Brian Johnson after services, first service, and he's fridges full of stuff. And that, it's great to see the family of God hear of people who are going through a physical ailment and coming alongside and helping in any way that they can and making a meal and, and doing all of that sort of thing. That's a beautiful picture of the the family of God. Sometimes we hear of, I hear about it probably more than you do, but sometimes I hear of the, the financial help that, yes, we have a benevolence fund that as members need, needs arise and we need to address them, that we, we come alongside them and help fund that. But it's beautiful when I hear of examples of people within the church hearing of a financial need and they themselves going forward and providing for that financial need. And that happens within this body of Christ, and it's an awesome thing. It sounds a lot like the early church in Acts chapter 2, that they sold of their possessions and gave it to meet the needs within the congregation. And provision for those when a need arises to help or to come alongside or use your expertise in an area. Or just this past few weeks, we saw a family in need of a car, and somebody stepped forward and provided a car that they no longer needed and be able to put that together and see that. It's a beautiful thing. That's what the church does. When there's need, we come alongside and lovingly care for our brothers and sisters. It's not always physical needs, though. Sometimes it's spiritual needs where we listen to and come alongside and comfort those who are struggling and who are suffering. And we were just singing this song, It Is Well. It's one of the, I think, one of the great hymns ever written. I love that song. But it takes on new meaning when you start thinking about what that, that song is about and the suffering, and yet the, the call that my soul finds its contentment in Jesus Christ, and therefore my soul, it is well with my soul, no matter what trials might come in this life. And as we're singing it, especially first hour, if you've ever been in a service where Gene Bodden is in the service. He's got one of them booming kind of bass voices, and he sings nice and loud, and even up here I could hear him when he's back there. But when you hear that and you think about all of what the Boddens are going through right now, and yet to sing that truth, it makes you remember and want to come alongside and hold up that family, hold up the Johnsons, hold up some of these other people who are very much spiritually and physically going through incredible trials right now. And that's what brothers and sisters do. They suffer alongside. They also notice when their family members are, are falling back, are drifting away, are struggling spiritually, and they come alongside to edify, to confront, to help build up so that that person stays on track and grows to the maturity that Christ intends in their life. All of this is part of what it means to spiritually, physically, lovingly care for our spiritual brothers and sisters. Now, one of the difficulties in a family this large is sometimes certain of our siblings we like more than others. I, I, that's just the reality of it, right? Are you saying, Phil, that some of, I like some of you more than I like others? No, I'm not saying that, sort of. No. I th I, there is a natural tendency to be drawn to some over others. But at the same time, we should never be harboring a bitterness or an enmity or allow walls to come up between us and other siblings within this family. That's not okay. Go back to Hebrews chapter 2. Why is that not okay? Because think about what Jesus did. Go back to Hebrews chapter 2, and he uses this family metaphor back there in verse nine and following, speaking of our, the sacrifice of Jesus on our behalf, we see Jesus who was made lower than the angels for a little while, 2.9, now crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. There's the gospel in a nutshell that Jesus Christ died for us. He paid the penalty for our sin so that we could be made right with God. And what does that mean then? In bringing many sons and daughters to glory, Christ brings us to the place where we will be glorified. It was fitting that God, for whom and through whom everything exists, should make the pioneer of their salvation, Jesus, perfect through what he suffered. Christ suffered 
so that we could be made perfect. Both the one who makes people holy and those who are made holy are the same, what? Family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them his brothers and sisters. What a beautiful picture that we become a part of the family of God because of the work of Jesus, but it was because Jesus wasn't afraid and ashamed to look at even those of us who are the enemies of God and die and lay down his life in sacrifice for us so that we could become his brothers and sisters. So then what would make us think that if we are a child of God and a sibling with Jesus Christ, because of the glory that he has attained in our life, that it's okay for us to harbor enmity or bitterness between another brother or sister within the family of God. That is not why Jesus did what he did. He did it so we could call him our brother and sister. Him, he could call us his brother and sister, and we could call one another brothers and sisters in Christ. We are brought into this relationship to lovingly care for one another. We demonstrate our faith in Jesus and our place in God's family by sacrificing ourselves for one another. The second way in which we live out this action of service toward the people in our life is toward those who are not only our brothers and sisters, but those who are strangers. Notice what he says in verse 2. Do not forget to show hospitality to strangers For by doing so, some people have shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. The command here is to hospitably care for those you don't know. It's the flip side of lovingly caring for one another within the family. The flip side is to show loving care and hospitable care for those who aren't a part of the family as well. I said there's these words that have this philos, love root in them. This is the word right here. It's the word love, Greek word for love, combined with the Greek word for stranger. Love of stranger is what it literally says. Do not forget to love strangers, the strangers in your midst. Service to God not only cares for the needs of one another, but it sees the needs of those around us with whom we are unfamiliar and is willing to hospitably care for them as well. Now, usually when we hear the word hospitality, what do we think of? What comes to mind with hospitality? We start thinking of like a gift of hospitality where I open my home and we have fellowship there. And and I think many believers view hospitality as, well, that's what I do with my brothers and sisters within the body of Christ. I have them over. We fellowship. I get to know them better. And and that's a, a component of hospitality. But biblical hospitality goes much further than that. Biblical hospitality emphasizes care and concern with those who come into our midst, and we are not familiar with these people. We don't know them. I think too many believers, even in our church, view the unfamiliar that come into their midst as, they kind of view them as that child who has been freshly worn by a parent or a a daycare worker to, to stay away from strangers, right? Stranger danger, stay away from them. And we avoid those with whom we are unfamiliar. That's not biblical. I mean, for a child, that makes sense. For an adult, we are not to be living like that. You know, we might not run away from them at all costs, but hospitality tells us that we are to move toward them, not to, and the the command here is really interesting. Do not forget, do not neglect, do not overlook is the idea. Because I I don't think we purposefully do this. I don't think we see somebody that's sitting next to us in the, the, I was going to say the pews. They're not pews, they're chairs. They're sitting in those chairs next to us and think, I'm purposefully not going to say hi to this person. But what I think we do is we look over them. We're not mindful of the fact, and we, again, we're we're, we're uh, preoccupied with our own concerns, our own interests, those those that are familiar to us, we see them. And so, We naturally gravitate in that direction and we neglect, we overlook those who are unfamiliar. Simple application of this is that when you walk through the foyer, when you go into that living room, right, and you see people as you come in there, 
again, you're naturally going to gravitate toward those that you know. You might have something to say to somebody. You might see somebody. It's like, let me go talk to them. I, I think that naturally comes to us. But the command here is to see those that you don't know as well and go and introduce yourself and talk to them. Be hospitable to them. Find out who they are. When you come into the sanctuary itself and you sit in, in the chairs, some of you arrive two minutes early, some are five, some are ten, some are 30 seconds late, okay? How whenever you get in here and you sit down, again, don't just sit and like kill time or get on the phone or do whatever. When you see that person around you that you don't know, introduce yourself to them, talk to them. Part of the reality is as people visit a church and they come in for the first time, most people, unless they're extreme extrovert, are not going to naturally just start introducing themselves to everyone. That's not how it works. They're, they're kind of going to stand off a little bit to the side because they want to see and sense and, and get a feel of what this place is like. Most visitors don't mingle in the foyer either. They typically will come into the sanctuary and get to their seat as quick as possible. For whatever reason, that's more comfortable. So we have to be purposeful about being willing to go toward them. Don't overlook them is the point. And again, this is where this is not optional. This is characteristic. Because again, I think, I think many of us go, well, this is, this is why people volunteer for the Welcome Center, and this is why people volunteer for First Impressions, and, and they'll catch those people. And Sometimes, yes, but not all the time. And sometimes lots of people come through the door at the same time, and then they make their way in, and they come in, and, and it can very easily happen where people get neglected. I think as, as I evaluate our church, if I was going to assess it, I would say we're, we're sporadic at this, meaning sometimes we do really well, and then sometimes we miss the boat. And COVID isn't helping because the welcome team and the first impressions team are running on kind of a bare-bones crew right now with people out. So it's incumbent upon us that are the members of this church, to reach out hospitably to those who come into our midst that we are unfamiliar with. And here's another huge truth of the way people work and evaluate a church that they come into. If people come into our services and do not connect, do not sense that that connection, that familial spirit, that, that people come toward them and and, and not only introduce themselves to them, but are willing to actually engage them and help them get connected into the flow of the church, within a few months, those people will not be attending our church anymore. That's just how it happens by percentage. If there's not connection outside of just coming and sitting in this, that, that typically will not last within a church. They will go elsewhere, and that's not their fault. Many times that's our fault. It's our responsibility to move toward them and hospitably care for them. The rationale at the, the end of this verse is rather interesting. It almost comes across spooky. Because you need to do this because sometimes you might actually entertain or be with angels unaware. And it's like, whoa, that's one of the interesting verses in Hebrews, right? And people want to go into this huge theology of angels and what does that mean and who's an angel here today? Is there one in the congregation that's visiting us? And I really, I mean, that might be what's going on here. I think it's a little bit different than that, though. He brings this up because there's some instances from the Old Testament where this happened just like this. And two of them happen in back-to-back -back chapters in Genesis 18 and Genesis 19. Strangers come to Abraham. Remember, and Abraham invites them in, and there's hospitality shown to them. And one of those strangers is whom? God himself, right? Right? God comes to Abraham and he makes that promise that within the next year, Sarah will give birth to a child and there's the whole incident of laughing and everything else like that. But the invitation and the hospitality shown resulted in God revealing himself to Abraham with that message. In the next chapter, you get strangers coming again to a situation and hospitality being shown again, this time by Abraham's nephew or his cousin Lot. And this time it wasn't about joy and birthing babies and all of that sort of stuff. The, the strangers that Lot invited in were angels that what? Came with a message that judgment is about to happen and you need to get out of this city. But it was still a message that resulted in Lot being preserved. 
And I think what the author of Hebrews is saying here is that we are to reach out and hospitably care for those that we don't know because sometimes through that, God has a message and will use those people to work in your lives to great effect that if they aren't connected, if you don't reach out, you will miss that blessing. And that might be for you individually, that might be for you as the congregation, us as the congregation. So we need to, as we come in contact with people who are unfamiliar with us, especially in the context of the church, welcome them, hospitably care for them, bring them into and connect to the body of Christ if that's the Lord's will for them. Because as a member of the body of Christ, if they become that, they will contribute to this, this body. They will edify it. You know, we met those new families last week that joined Clearwater Community Church. One of the things I always tell them in the elder interview when I'm doing that is God brings you into his body, this family, so that you edify us. You build us up somehow. Your gifts are unique within this body to be used for the furtherance of this church, the ministry of Christ within this church. We need that. And the connection is as we show hospitable care for them to bring them in. The third aspect of service addressed here is toward those that are suffering. Verse 3, continue to remember those in prison as if you were together with them in prison and those who are mistreated as if you yourselves were suffering. Towards those that are suffering, being persecuted for Jesus Christ, for the name of Christ, think about those suffering and act accordingly. Just like the previous command, we're exhorted here to take our minds off of our own interests, off of our own concerns, and think about, ponder those who are going through severe trials for their faith in Jesus. We saw earlier in this letter that some of these believers had been um, ostracized from their family. They had their finances and property confiscated from them. Some of them had even been imprisoned for the testimony of Jesus Christ. And the author is reminding these early readers of this letter, don't neglect them. Part of imprisonment in the first century was shame. It was to shame the prisoner, but it was also to shame the rest of those connected to them, to stay away from, to withdraw from them. And the author is saying here, don't neglect, don't pull away. They need you. How would you want to be treated if you were imprisoned for the, for the name of Jesus Christ? How would you want people to treat you in the midst of that kind of suffering as you were going through that severest of dis difficulties? And for sure, we must respond or we would want people to be doing what? Be praying for us regularly, lifting us up before Jesus Christ. We can't get to all of those that are in prison, but we can sure pray for them. Now, this is an interesting command for us that are in North America. Why? Because there's few, if any, people are being persecuted to this level where they're being imprisoned for the name of Jesus Christ. So what is our connection to the suffering church? There are believers around this world who are suffering for the name of Jesus Christ, who are under severe persecution because they believed in Jesus Christ. Our closest connection to them would be through our missionaries, right? Right? Our missionaries are, are, are working and evangelizing and discipling in certain fields where it is not safe to, uh, to, uh, to confess Jesus as Lord. But do we even know which missionaries are having that kind of difficulty? Do we even know what's going on in the lives of the people to whom they're ministering? They provide us with monthly updates, but are our people aware of them? Are we reading them? Are we praying for these people? I was with one of our missionaries two weeks ago, and he was conveying to me one of, uh, a situation in the Middle East. One of, he, he goes in and out of the Middle East, and he was talking about this uh, one, uh, one region where this lady now from their ministry has come to faith in Jesus Christ. She has confessed Jesus as Lord within a, within a, a Muslim context. And immediately as she started to tell her family that Christ is her Lord, she's accepting Jesus and rejecting Islam, they call the family meeting together where Literally hundreds of family members were brought in to denounce her to her face to get her to relinquish this confession of Jesus Christ. And she refused to do it. Regardless of what her family was doing and, and how they were pushing her out, she said, I'm not going to do that. Jesus is Lord of my life, and I confess him as Lord. Guess what the family's done? They've taken her children away from her and will never let her see them again. 
And in that context, they're allowed to do that. Because they don't want any influence of Jesus Christ over the lives of those children. And she is separated now from her children because of her confession of Jesus Christ as Lord. And she's still holding up even under that. But so many of us in our cushy lives here in North America have no idea what Christians are going through around the world to simply confess Jesus as Lord. And the author here says, remember them, think about them, ponder what you can do toward them as if you were in their shoes. We need at base level to be praying and lifting up our fellow brothers and sisters, especially those that our missionaries are ministering to around this world. It's incumbent that we're lifting them up. I mean, there's a simple way to apply this. I mean, we, we have a, a sign-up for our, our missionary prayer guide that goes out every single month. We'll send it to you digitally, and you can lift up our missionaries in prayer. Debbie Lichtenberg is the one who oversees that, and there's a sign-up sheet on one of the tables out there, but do that. Clearwater Community Church can serve even our fellow believers around the world by praying for them. Fourth, the fourth area he focuses in on in service is that of our spouse. Notice what he says in verse 4. Marriage should be honored by all, and the marriage bed kept pure, for God will judge the adulterer and all the sexually immoral. When we think about the idea of marriage and our spouse or spouses within our congregation, we are to vigilantly remain sexually pure. Within the Christian community, serving God means that marriage is highly esteemed and it is valued by all. Catch that again in verse 4 at the beginning. Marriage should be honored by whom? All. All within the congregation, all within the church are to value marriage. This doesn't mean that everyone is to seek marriage, but that we respect this first human institution that God created. Do you realize that? You go back to Genesis chapter 2. The first, the altar, the, really the pinnacle of creation, of human interaction with one another that God created was marriage. In Genesis 2, he brings the man, the man and the woman together and unites them in marriage. God created marriage. And we are to value that within the church. How do we do that? For those of us with a marriage partner, we should be diligently pursuing the other person through love, through respect, Ephesians chapter 5, so that the marriage is strengthened. Our choices, our communication with our spouse should be such that it builds them up rather than deteriorates the relationship. We demonstrate that we value our spouse in the way that we communicate the choices that we make toward them. For those of us outside that marriage relationship, we honor marriage honor the married couple by making sure that our conduct in no way infringes on or does anything that would damage that marriage relationship. So it's inappropriate for us at times to overburden or monopolize somebody else's time to the neglect of their spouse. That would be wrong. We should be very careful about how we interact with a married couple, that there should be nothing inappropriate in our actions towards a, a, a member of a marriage union. Further, for those who may one day be married or are single now, you value marriage by remaining pure in anticipation of that future relationship. You serve your spouse well in that way. He goes on to say the marriage bed must be kept pure. The marriage bed is the place where sex takes place, and in biblical marriage, we understand that God established that as the boundaries, marriage, the boundaries within which sex occurs, and Jesus taught this in Matthew chapter 19. This is one of the things that I most despise about people who claim to be followers of Jesus Christ, and yet they will argue or pursue the idea that, well, homosexuality is acceptable in our day and age. And one of their first arguments is that, well, Jesus never addressed the issue of homosexuality. I said it first hour. I said, that's such bull crap. And I got myself in trouble after service. 
I should have used the stronger language because honestly, that's what it is. People get upset about vulgar language in Scripture. Go read Ezekiel 16. Go read Galatians chapter 5. Sometimes it needs to be harshly confronted. And when Christians would dare say that Jesus didn't teach this, it's just ludicrous. He says in Matthew 19 that God created them, what? Male and female. Binary system. And then he brought them together in a marriage re, a relationship between a man and a woman. And whatever God has brought together, don't let any man tear that asunder. That's the clear teaching of Jesus on all kinds of issues that are pertinent to our day and age on sexuality. He clearly addressed it. That God has established this marriage bed between a husband and his wife. And he goes on to say here, and the author does in this passage, that any sin outside of that, any sexual activity performed outside that marriage co context is sin. The Bible speaks of immorality here. Those, those who would perform immoral acts or have sex with those with whom they are not maritally covenanted are involved in immorality. Those who would come into and break up a marriage union to enter into a sexual relationship are the adulterous in this text. And both groups, whether it's those who are sexually immoral in their activity or the adulterer, what does it say? God will judge. God will judge these sins. He takes it that seriously. It seems odd that this comes up in the context of service within the body of Christ. But when we're seeking to fulfill these earlier commands of lovingly care for one another, our brothers and sisters, and hospitably caring for the stranger within our community, we need this exhortation about marriage so that we understand that we are to treat one another with love and respect as demonstrated in our fidelity to the biblical teaching on marriage and sex. Our brothers and sisters in this body need us to be praying for them about this. We care for them by doing that. We do that as especially we lift up our young people to prayer because they are being bombarded and being reprogrammed is probably the best way to describe it by the system of this secular age and the education that they are receiving to think that it's okay to dismiss the clear teaching of God's word on this. We need to pray for them. We need to pray for their parents who are swimming in trying to figure out how do I even get any kind of traction whatsoever in my kid's life to even speak into this issue. For those that might be struggling, whether you're a young person or an older person, with same-sex attraction. So many of us, we dismiss this and we think it's odd or crude because we don't struggle with it, right? Right? But we struggle in other areas of sin. I mean, that's the reality of sin. Some people are going to be bent more toward this, whether it's through the influence of how they grew up or some of the choices that they have now made. But this is a reality in their life. It's a struggle. It's a temptation. But my challenge is to you that you are to act on God's directive and what His Word says about this rather than inner feelings, desires, emotional connection, all of that stuff. Because what society is telling us today is that the real you is the one that you feel inside and you are to act on that and the genuine self comes out when we act on our feelings and our emotions and we make choices in line with that. That's the authentic self. But God's word is what gives us the direction in our life, not the inner feeling of how my authentic self feels. And if I'm a Christian, if I'm a follower of Jesus Christ, and I'm saying I'm a follower of Jesus Christ, that means that I value this and what this says and how this directs my life over how I feel inside. And we need to model that for our young people and our people that are struggling in this area need to have that conviction come into their heart that even though I'm struggling with this, this is what God says and I'm going to commit my life to following Jesus Christ and I'm going to choose his word over my feelings. But those of us that are adults and don't struggle in this area or others that don't struggle in this area, we need to recognize that any sexual sin 
any immorality is an affront to the holiness of God. And even if it's done in secrecy, and even if we can conceal it, and even if we can get away with it for a season, that doesn't make it right. That doesn't excuse it. That doesn't allow us to act on that and then confess it later because, oh, God will forgive me. I mean, it's amazing how we'll justify sinning in this area. And this is just as harsh toward us to say, remain vigilantly pure in your sexuality. God sees all sexual sin, even if you can keep it from everyone else. And as this text indicates, He will judge it. We serve one another by vigilantly remaining sexually pure, by modeling that and then coming alongside and praying for our fellow brothers and sisters who are in this battle all the time. And the last one, the last S of these people that are in our lives are self, ourselves. Notice verse 5, keep your lives free from the love of money. And be content with what you have because God has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? It's the third philos root word here, love. It's connected with the term for money, commerce. Love of money, love, care for money. But it has this negative on the front of it. Ah, it it negates it. Not love for money is what it says. Be freed up from, do not love money. It's very similar to the the teaching in 1 Timothy where uh, it's not so much just money itself or the accumulation of money, but the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. We need to free ourselves. Our conduct must be free from this pursuit of money. Because if we care for money, we won't care for the needs of our brothers and sisters or the strangers that we are to hospitably care for. We'll be too distracted to focus on these other more important issues. The love for money distracts. It pulls us away from those other relationships because it consumes our time. Again, it's not that you, it's not, this is not a command just for the wealthy because many of us are still enamored with and worried about and constantly looking at our checkbooks to figure out money and addict money and how does this work and we're consumed with money. We are to conduct our lives free from that. How do we go about doing that? Be content with what you have. Recognizing that, here's this idea of content, we have enough. The things that God has given us are enough. We're reading through the Gospels in our men's study on Thursday morning, a group that I lead, and we're, in this, we're reading through the Bible. We're in this section in the Gospels on the teachings of Jesus. And I, I'm just struck again and again how much time Jesus spends on the theme of money. It is over and over and over, and there's sometimes whole chapters are on parables and teaching of Jesus about money. We are to seek God and his kingdom and conduct our life in a way that recognizes God cares for us. There's nothing wrong with doing things well. We should work hard. We should do things with excellence. We will receive payment for that. There's nothing wrong with that. He's not condemning that in this text. But I am convinced that God expects those of us who are his followers with what we receive, that we live with that and we conduct our lives frugally with that financial benefit. We don't simply spend on self. We don't look to spend only on self. We need to be freed up from that pursuit of self so that we can serve one another. The command here is that we need to practice contentment. And it's so hard in our culture today to practice contentment. I mean, it's not just advertising on TV, right? It's, you you can be on any website and you have multiple ads coming up that I didn't even know that they, I mean, it's amazing what Amazon can do, right? Like, it's all tied, it's all, I think it is actually in our brains now. I mean, the way that I can be thinking about something and then it pops up on the screen and it's like, how are they advertising that to me right now? I, you know, that's kind of creepy. 
but it does, it, it, it knows our patterns, and it knows how to appeal, and it knows how to advertise right to those things that we want. And it's also crazy when you go on Amazon and you make that purchase, right? And you're going to have it sent, and then you're kind of scrolling down to make the purchase, and you go by that little section where it says, oh, and if you bought this, you're going to need to buy this thing and this thing and this thing as well. And it's, oh, yeah, I better get those too, you know, I need that. And you, you end up, the Amazon truck's making a visit every single day to your house. We're not content with what we have. We buy into that societal pressure to, you need this, you need to have this, this will make you happy, you need to keep up with these folks, the Joneses, right? I don't know what's wrong with the Joneses, but you know, we're not supposed to keep up with them. But when we get into that mindset that as we look around, we, and Christians, we are, I, I'm convinced we're so susceptible to this, that we, we order our lives and we conduct our lives thinking, I got to provide for my family this, and my children will need this, and they need this kind of education so they can get into this kind of college so that they are successful in life down here. And grandparents, we do the same kinds of things, and it's, it's all about buying into the world's system of what success is rather than finding our contentment in Jesus Christ. And when we start going down that and following that, it's going to pull us away from the connections that really matter within the body. Are we listening more to what our society is telling us is important, what our children need, what our grandchildren need, or are we listening to the Word of God that says what they need modeled for them, our parents and grandparents who serve one another, who are hospitable to those that are unfamiliar to them? How are you connected here at CCC? How are you serving would your service suggest that you're more preoccupied with self because you see service as optional? Or would it suggest you are connected into the vitality of relationships within this community of faith? You see, the main idea of this stretch of text, I've, I've tried to succinctly state it in this statement, but service focuses on the situation and needs of others by de-emphasizing the desires of self. Service focuses on the situation, the needs of others. And again, this flies counter to what our culture is teaching us today. To elevate self, to go after what gratifies self, and then to go out into community and influence. But this is not Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ came to what? Be served? He came to serve and to give his life. And if we model Jesus Christ in our own relationship with him, and if we as a church are going to model Jesus Christ to this world around us, it's not going to be because we are being served by the church, but because we serve the body of Jesus Christ. We serve one another. We serve the marriages and the families within this church. We de-emphasize self. I mean, the reality is we love ourselves way too much anyways, right? That's never going to be negligent or we're going to somehow forget to love ourselves. I mean, it's amazing to me, that pop psychology, right? You've got to learn to love yourself. You love yourself. We all do. That's why he says, love your neighbor as yourself, Jesus, right? We know how to do that. But do we see the need around us and are we willing to not optionally serve but is it characteristic? Is it the fruit that comes out of our life? I'm going to close us with a word of prayer, but I'm going to ask you, as you're sitting here today, thinking about, and as the word of God, this has hit all kinds of aspects of life. Go to God silently right there. Confess where you fail in some of these areas. Receive again that free forgiveness that salvation brings to us where we can be set free from our sin struggles in these areas and ask God to enable you to serve well within his body. Let's close in a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you for your word and the challenge of your word. But your word, Lord, really reveals to us Jesus Christ. It re reveals to us your character. And when we think of Jesus Christ, 
And we think of the, the one who sits right now at your right hand side, ready to return someday to set up his kingdom on this earth. The most, gl- <laughs> he's God, he's the glorious one, he's the slain lamb. But God, when you chose to reveal who you are in your very nature, you sent Jesus to serve us. We so easily think of Jesus as king, but do we ever think of Jesus as servant? And yet that's who Jesus is. It's who you are, God. It's one of, it comes out as one of your attributes that's crazy to us. We don't think of it that way, but you serve. You're willing to give of yourself, your own son to us, so that we can be brought into your family. God, may we be gripped by that truth. May that seep into our lives. May we not just walk out of here this morning and dismiss that. But Lord, we, out of grateful thanksgiving and gratitude for what you've done for us in Jesus Christ and that you are bringing us to Mount Zion, as we receive Jesus Christ as your word, may we serve you. And may it be seen in our treatment of our siblings here, the strangers that come into our midst. May it be seen as we pray for and lift up those who are suffering around this world for the cause of Christ. Lord, as we, we think about the marriages and the family units within this church, God, may we serve these people well in our lives and as a congregation. Finding our contentment in you. And God, may you shine forth then through this community of faith drawing others to yourself, using those that come into this church to edify and build this church up as they connect into this family, Clearwater Community Church. God, may all of this be done to your glory, not for our own interests, but for your interests, for your glory and the interests of others. Thank you, Jesus, for being willing to serve us. May we serve as we mirror you within this community of faith. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. As you're dismissed this morning, I just wanted to say to those that might be visiting, I apologize if you get bombarded after this morning's service by people coming after you, but at least we'll be doing that for the next couple of weeks as we keep challenging this. But I pray that we as a church serve one another well. Go this week testifying to the fact that we are the servants of Jesus Christ in his family. We'll gather next week. We'll see you then. Have a great week.